gift giving is something that has been associated with Christmas almost right from the beginning. Matthew's gospel tells us of some kings from the east, some wise men who came sometime after Jesus was born. They came to worship him. And part of their worship was bringing him gifts. They brought him gold and they brought him frankincense and they brought him, brought him myrrh. In about the fourth century, so about 400 years later, there was a bishop named Nicholas who became known for giving gifts and his kindness has become more closely associated with Christmas down through the years. And today, fast forward to today, it's become a part of the fabric of celebrating Christmas. Likely the vast majority of people here this evening have spent some time shopping for some gifts. How many people have fought the crowds in the malls? Actually, today, most people are probably shopping on Amazon, I'm guessing, and just skip the crowds altogether. But most of us have probably spent some time looking for some gifts, and most of us here this evening probably have the expectation of getting some gifts at some point through the Christmas season. And as we get gifts, it's impossible, I think it's impossible anyway, to avoid gift comparison. It's hard to get away from the feeling that some gifts are better than others. I remember vividly as a young boy the Christmas my parents got my brother and I a Nintendo. I'm talking like the original Nintendo system. That was way better than the clothes that I got that year. It's impossible. I can only imagine that there's a big difference between feeling a feeling that you get when someone receives a vacuum versus a diamond necklace. (laughs) Now, there are a number of factors involved in how a person feels about a particular gift. One of the factors is who is giving the gift. Another factor is the value of the gift. Another factor might be the need of the gift. And then the desire for the gift and how much we appreciate it. All those things go into what makes a good Christmas gift. I mean, just imagine a small toddler makes a card that says, Merry Christmas, you're my favorite person. I mean, you would have to have a heart of stone not to like that gift, right? On the other hand, a man who buys his wife a cookbook And the card reads, Merry Christmas, you need this. (laughs) That, now I can see the look on someone's face. It's a look of panic. They've gotten that gift and they're wondering, (laughs) what do I do now? (laughs) That reaction's gonna be really different. What about when all the factors of a good Christmas gift come together. The gift is coming from someone that you value, someone that you value deeply. The gift comes at great cost. And it's a gift that you really need. And it's a gift that you really appreciate. If all of that comes together, then you end up with a very good gift. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that Christmas is not about gifts that you find under a tree or in a stocking or stuffed in an envelope, but it is about a gift. I would say Christmas is about the gift. It comes from someone of immeasurable worth who gives a gift of infinite value, and it is a gift that we all really need. And so really, there's only a couple of questions that are up in the air for us. And the question is, do we want it? And do we appreciate it? I want to take a few minutes this evening and talk to you about the gift of Christmas from a passage in the Bible in the book of 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. In this part of God's Word, He has three important lessons for us about the gift of Christmas. Lesson one is this. The gift of Christmas is life-defining. Whether or not you have received the gift of Christmas determines the most important thing in life. Whether or not you have a relationship with God. 
The gift of Christmas is life-defining. It's life-defining because Almighty God is the one who gives the gift of Christmas. Now, the love of the Lord is the focus of verses 7 and 8 in this chapter of 1 John, and we'll see how that relates to the gift of Christmas in verses 9 and 10. But first, let's look together at verses 7 and 8 of 1 John chapter 4. It says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In order for us to hear these verses correctly, we need to understand what love is. It is very easy for us to deceive ourselves on this point because our culture has such a misunderstanding of what love is. Most people in our time, perhaps many if not most of you here this evening, have bought into the lie that everyone gets to define love for themselves. Most people reduce it down to a, a strong feeling that inspires some kind of devotion to another person. Those feelings may or may not last, but either way, there's no sense of anything outside of yourself to evaluate or define what love is. And because that's true, you can hear these words from God's word about being loving and that making you, uh, that displaying that you're in a right relationship with God. You can hear that and you can think, I'm totally cool with God because I'm a loving person, therefore everything is fine. That can only be true if the kind of love that you have is consistent with who God is. We don't get to define, as human beings, we don't get to define what love is. And the fact is, is that if love can mean anything, then it means nothing. If you think you can decide for yourself what love is, then you're setting yourself up as your own God. And therefore, you're setting yourself up against the Lord. That's the whole point of what these verses have to say. Love that is genuine and true shows whether or not you know God. These verses leave no middle ground for us. You've either been born of God or you haven't. You either know God or you don't. You either have a relationship with him or you don't. There's no fence sitting in the kingdom of heaven. And so that puts the highest possible importance on what this whole idea of love is. Our eternity depends on understanding what love is. And that is what Christmas is all about. What we know and what we believe about Christmas will define who we are in terms of whether we know God or whether we don't. The next couple of verses in this passage make that clear and give us another lesson about the gift of Christmas. Here's the second lesson, is that the gift of Christmas is life-giving. The Bible clearly teaches that everyone who disobeys God, and that's everyone, everyone who disobeys God is spiritually dead, and they live under the shadow of death. But if you understand, if you love, and if you believe what the Lord offers you through sending his son into the world, that changes all of that. That's the gift of Christmas. The gift of Christmas is life-giving. If the kind of love that's talked about here in these verses is so life-defining, it would seem that it's very important for us to know what it is. And according to verse 9, we're told, listen to what it says here. In this, the love of God was made manifest. In other words, in this, the love of God was made known to the world. Listen very carefully to what this says. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. The gift of Christmas is God the Father sending God the Son into the world. And it's in this gift that God's love is made known to us. There is no greater giver of a gift than God. He is the highest and best being who exists. 
There is no greater gift that could possibly be given than the gift of the one who by the power of his word spoke all things in all of creation into existence. That is the greatest miracle and the greatest gift the world has ever known. And we're told here the reason for God giving the gift of his son, that is Jesus, to the world. We're told at the end of the verse, it says here that God sent his only son into the world so that for the reason that we might live through him. Now, that's talking about more than just physical life. We all have that right now. We're all physically alive in this room. It's also referring here to spiritual life. The fact is, without Jesus, we are all spiritually dead on account of the fact that we've all broken God's law and we've done that more times than we're all even aware of. You can read that for yourself in Ephesians chapter 2, if you want. It talks about us being dead in our sins. That spiritual death always leads to physical death. And that is where we all end up. That is where we would all end up, except for the gift of Christmas. The gift of God sending Jesus into the world so that we might live through him. That we might come to life spiritually. We'll see that in verses 11 and 12. And that we might come to life physically. That's the promise of Christmas. That death will be defeated. And when King Jesus comes, all who belong to him will be raised from the dead and live with him forever. He came. The gift of Christmas is so that you might live. There's no greater gift than that. And God gives that gift on account of his glorious love, which is further explained in verse 10. Listen to what he says here. In this love, that is the love of sending his son into the world, in this love, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The gift of Christmas is a completely one-sided gift. Not based on our worth, not based on our right feelings towards God. In fact, it says here, we didn't love God, we didn't care about him at all, and yet he sent his son into the world. This is solely based on the greatness of who God is. God is loving. In fact, it says in this verse that God is love, that his very nature defines what love is. But he's also just. Jesus came into the world, it says here, to be a propitiation for our sins. That means that Jesus perfectly satisfied all of our offenses, all of our crimes against God. Jesus satisfied that on our behalf. He did that by dying roughly 33 years after he was born in Bethlehem. He died on a cross in Jerusalem, completely satisfying the just wrath of God against our sins, against our offenses. And because he did that, We can live through him. That is the gift of Christmas. And that's how we know what love is. Love that is from God is love that seeks the highest good of people. And that is true. Love seeks the highest good of people regardless of how those people might feel about us. Regardless of what it might cost us. And the highest good of people is for them to find forgiveness and life in Christ. Now, if you can see those two things, if you can see that the gift of Christmas is life-defining, and if you can see that the gift of Christmas is life-giving, then you'll see that this third lesson from this text has to come. This is the lesson, that the gift of Christmas is life-changing. When what the Lord offers through his son takes root in your life, it makes a difference. And that difference gets lived out. The gift of Christmas is life changing. This passage begins with a command to love one another. Doing that reveals that we really belong to God. 
That's because God is love, and so whoever belongs to him is going to be loving. And then it's also life-giving, and then that knowledge gets applied here in verses 11 through 12. Listen to what it says. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. In other words, if we really understand what it means for God to love us, and that's what Christmas is all about, if we really understand what it means for God to love us, then it will follow that we will love one another. That's the clearest display of what it means to belong to God, is that he's at work in us. He's making us alive in Christ. It says here at the end of verse 12 that God's love is perfected in us. It does not mean, when he says that, it does not mean that we make God's love perfect as though we have any part in improving the nature of God. God can never, listen to this, God can never be more loving and more perfect than he is. What this means is that this display, this showing of godly love, if we're loving one another in a godly way, it means that is the goal of God's love for us being lived out in us. That's why God loves you, so that you will love one another. God does not give the gift of Christmas so that we might stay the same self-centered people that we were before we received the gift. God gives the gift of his one and only son so that we might be changed. And it's impossible to receive the greatest gift in the history of the world from the God of the universe and be unaffected by it. It's impossible to receive the greatest gift in history and have its effects fade over time. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have had this, had this experience with Christmas gifts in the past. What do you do with gifts that you don't really want? Right? You open that gift on Christmas morning or Christmas Eve or whenever you open gifts, and you're like, thanks. <laughs> and then what happens to the gift? It goes on the shelf. It might be rewrapped and given to somebody else. It might go straight into the garbage can. I don't know. But the bottom line is it goes away and it changes nothing. Life just goes on. You know, you can do that not just with a gift at Christmas. You can do that with the gift of Christmas. You can, you can look at God giving his only son and you can say, no thanks, and want nothing to do with it. And you know what will happen? Nothing will change in your life. In fact, if you have no capacity for the kind of godly, selfless love that's talked about in this passage, then I would say to you, there is no reason to think that you've received the Christmas gift at all. That brings us back to the beginning of our time together. The gift of Christmas is given by Almighty God, who should be the most important person in your life, the person of highest value in your life. Is he? He's the gift giver. The gift is the gift of his only Son, who ought to be worth more to you than anything else in your life. Since all of us have committed crimes against God, we're all in desperate need of this gift, of Jesus being born, living a perfect life, dying and rising again to defeat death for us. We all need this gift more than anything else. And that's true whether you admit it or not. You might go out of here thinking, I don't need Jesus. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. The only question that remains is, so those are all the 
qualities of a great gift. This is the greatest gift ever. ever. The only question that remains is, do you want it? Do you want the gift of Christmas? Do you appreciate it? If you do, then it will define your life because you will belong to God forever. If you do, then it will be life-giving. Your heart will be awakened to the things of God and the hope of eternal life. If you receive this gift, it will be life-changing because you will begin to love with the kind of love that God has loved you with. Just imagine for a minute. I want you to think about an awkward family Christmas gathering where there's that person in your family or your friend or somebody you know who you don't really like very much. And it's not going to be a fun dinner. I want you to think about that. Now, I want you to think about it. Just imagine for a moment, what if you had forgiveness in your heart instead of bitterness? Imagine a Christmas where you had love. I mean, genuine, biblical, godly love in your heart. What if you had that instead of resentment, even for people who don't love you? Imagine what might change if God changed you. All of us have likely received many gifts over the years and will likely get a few more this year. But what we need most of all is not another gift under the tree. What we need most of all is the gift of Christmas, the gift of Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, because there is no greater gift and there is no other God. Let's pray. Lord, the gift of Christmas is so absolutely amazing. And I thank you for everyone here who knows it. I thank you for everyone here whose heart has been opened to the love that you have for us in Christ whose eyes and hearts have been opened to their need of forgiveness for their sin, whose eyes and hearts have been opened to the greatness of Christ and all that he's done on our behalf. I thank you for them, Lord, and I thank you for the blessing that we get to enjoy of celebrating this great gift, the greatest gift in the history of the world. And Lord, for those who don't, I pray that something in the songs that we've sung, in the scripture that we've looked at, Something would tug at their hearts so that they might see the great gift that you have for us in Christ. Lord, I pray that for all of our good and for your glory. Amen.
Oh.